So the Apostle Paul writes a book of Galatians to the church at Galatia. Chapter number one deals with how the Apostle Paul didn't get saved for the glory of man. He doesn't preach for the glory of man. He did it because God wanted him to get saved. And he preached the word of God because that's what he was called to do. That's what God wanted him to do. And that he didn't do it for the glorification of man. In fact, he, you find, chapter number one, for three years after the road to Damascus experience, he was in Damascus. He stayed there. And then after three years, then he went and saw Peter. Stayed with him for 15 days. He said, I didn't need the approval or the acceptance of anybody else to be what God wanted me to be. And he said, God wanted me in Damascus for three years. I stayed there. I wasn't worried about it. Okay, then he goes to Jerusalem. Chapter number two kicks off. Once he was in Jerusalem, they sent him off to, well, they didn't send him off. God sent him off to start missionary churches. Okay? He did that for 14 years. Then chapter number two, 14 years after he went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Okay? He went by revelation uh, and commu communicated unto them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. Okay, he's saying, 14 years later, I go back. He says, there was a problem that needed to be addressed. He said, some had snuck in unawares. He said, this is a chapter where we find out that, it, you know, he has to rebuke Peter. He says that James and John and, uh, can't remember the other way, he, he names three apostles that said that they weren't in favor of the doctrine of circumcision, that in order to be saved, you have to be circumcised. Okay? He said those three would fellowship with anybody. It didn't matter if you were Jew, Gentile, whatever. He said Peter and some others, though, they would withdraw when the Gentiles would come in because they thought that they were unclean. Then he gets into his discussion and his analysis, which is very detailed, very complex, because after all, he was a Pharisee of the highest order. You can find that in chapter number one. He talks about what he used to be before God saved him. He says he took advantage more than you know, many of the others that were of his station of his position. Okay, he was all about elevating himself. Okay, but he says the law, you can't have faith and law. He says it's one or the other. Okay, so then from chapter 2 all the way down through chapter number 3, he's talking about you can't claim faith and still try to hold somebody else under the law. He says they're ex mutually exclusive. They don't mix. They're oil and water. He says the law, this is where we get the hallmark verse, the law was our schoolmaster to teach us that we were sinners. Okay, but this is also, uh, chapter number three is the chapter where we find out that after faith came, the law didn't serve any more purpose. The law was to show us that we were sinners, and after we get saved, I'm no longer a sinner, I'm a saint. So the law has no use for me in trying to obtain favor with God. Certainly. Do what the Bible The law was given to us to show us what was sin. Don't commit sin after you get saved. Okay? Now, you don't have to have the law memorized like the Apostle Paul did because he had the first five books of the Bible committed to memory. Okay? You don't have to have the law memorized in order to know everything because we'll get into it a little bit here in a minute. I've got the Spirit inside me that leads, guides, and directs me. He will reveal unto me what is the path. I've got his word, which is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. And because of all that, if I just follow after the spirit, which lives inside me, I don't have to worry about sinning or trespassing against God. But certainly, if you go back and study the Old Testament, but I'm not under bondage anymore by the law. I don't have to answer to the law. The law is not the final authority in my life. Because of faith, God is. Jesus Christ is. My Savior is. Okay, now he talks at the end of chapter number 3 how because of salvation and we heard a little bit about this from the pastor not too long ago. We've received the adoption of sonship. We've been born into the family of God because Jesus told Nicodemus over in John uh, chapter number 4 I believe it was that you must be born again. Okay, you got to be born again in the spirit. We've been born, we've been adopted and one day we'll get married into the family at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay? All that being said, then we get to chapter number 4. Okay? We'll read the first couple of verses from chapter number 4, and then we'll get into the thought today. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, 
though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, we'll stop there for a moment. Okay, now, remember, chapter number three, we're under faith now, not under law. Okay, I'm not in bondage to the law. Okay, I'm no longer in chains. If the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Okay, chapter number four, verse number one, and if you go back one verse and if ye be Christ then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise okay Jesus grafted in a vine into himself so that the Gentiles could be saved and there's no difference anymore between the Jew and the Greek I could take you a handful of times and a handful of books where the Apostle Paul deliberately lines out that there's no separation between Gentile and Jew because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Okay, so if you're in Christ, you're an heir, just like God promised Abraham that his seed would be an heir to the things of God. God's chosen people. Okay, I'm one of them. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay, but chapter number four, verse number one, he's talking about those heirs. If you are in Christ, now you're an heir. Okay, so chapter number... 4 verse 1 he says now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father just cause a king has a son doesn't mean that the day that the baby's born the baby's in charge he's an heir one day he'll own everything he owns it all right now he just hasn't received it yet okay, but he's not in charge Who's in charge? The Father's in charge. Okay, now there are times that we can go and we can study the life of David. David had announced who his successor would be. That was Solomon. He promised Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, years in advance. And then one of his sons tried to, you know, usurp the throne, usurp Solomon. We taught on that not many weeks ago at Sunday school class. But Sometimes they'll name who the successor will be if they've got multiple sons. But until the king says, I'm no longer king, or until the king says, all right, now you have this authority, he owns it all. He has no authority. He has no power. He can't walk up to somebody. Well, they may oblige him because he is the son of the king. Okay, we do get benefits that we didn't used to get just because now I'm an heir to the king. Okay, but I can't walk up to Brother Tommy and say, Brother Tommy, this week, God doesn't want you to do this, this, or this. Do this instead. I can't do that. Well, you're an heir to God. Yeah, but I'm not Lord over Tommy's life. I'm still a child. Okay, I may not be as young as I used to be. Certainly there are people in here that are older than I am, okay? I'm not the eldest. I, I can't claim rank here, right? So y'all have more authority than I do. Some of y'all been saved longer than I've been alive, okay? Y'all are older in the things of God than you used to be. But still, in this flesh, we're, we're but children. Okay, God has given us, in verse number three, I'm sorry, verse number two, there are tutors and there are governors. Okay, the heir, the one that will own it all one day, has to answer to tutors, teachers, those that are sent to instruct them, to help them, to help mature them, and then governors, who even though one day he's got a claim to the throne, right now, if he goes to Ohio, he's got to obey the governor of Ohio. Okay, right now, if he... Goes to Kentucky. He's got to obey the rules and laws of Kentucky. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible, I can take you over to Philippians and show you where it does say, obey the laws for the Lord's sake. But anyway, be subject to those that have the rule over you. But there are those that are given authority over, not just in the world, but in the church. 
in God's hierarchy. Okay, there will never be a point in a Christian's life before they get to heaven or before the rapture happens that it's the will of God for them not to have a pastor. That it's the will of God for them not to come to a church. You will never mature to the point where you can exist on your own and be in the exact perfect will of God. Unless you're a missionary and you're preaching to yourself out in the wilderness somewhere like John the Baptist used to in the wilderness. He's out there by himself just preaching all the time, having himself a time because God's given him the message that one day he's going to take to the world. Okay, nobody heard the message except for the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. But for three years he was in Damascus learning from the Lord. Okay, he was called to be an apostle. He had to learn those things. Only God could teach him those things. Okay, those things are done with. Those gifts, those talents are done away with because that which is complete, the word has been given. None of us are going to have a road to Damascus. Long story short, got to have a pastor. Got to have a church. You cannot exist on your own. Even those missionaries that go out, they have sending churches. They are members of a church somewhere. There are those that they can still call up and say, hey, I'm going through it. Can you give me something from the Word? I've prayed, but it's just like there's no answer. Can you just encourage me a little bit? No man is an island. We all have tutors. We all have governors. We all have those around us to help us to build it because we're fitly framed together. Can't do it on your own, but we can be one, one piece of the whole. But keep in mind, this is the heir. This is the prince. May not be a prince. May be the heir to a position. Right? We do have these things called elections. And elections happen in November, but inaugurations don't happen until January. There are times that somebody's president, and then there's somebody that's been elected president, but they can't be president yet for three months. They haven't been inaugurated yet. Okay, well, what, what happens? Well, technically... They're president, they're president elect. That's their time. But they can't do anything until January. They're an heir to the office, but the time hasn't come that they've been given the authority from the Father. Okay, now let's get down to verse number three through six, and then we'll get to the thought. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. He's talking about the law. He's talking about in sin, when we were children in the flesh, we were in bondage even though we didn't know it. But verse number four, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive. He's saying, Jesus, we know. We can go to the book of John. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. Without the word was nothing made. He's there in the beginning. He was part of everything that happened. But we also know that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was an heir to the cross. But the time hadn't come that God had appointed. But one day that time was fulfilled. Okay, verse number uh, four tells us when the fullness of time was come, then he submitted himself to the cross so that we which were under the law could be made sons. Okay, now I'm not saying that before Jesus came and was born of a virgin under the law to fulfill the law so that we could be saved. I am not saying, do not misinterpret this, into thinking that Jesus wasn't God before he was born and fulfilled his earthly mission. No, John chapter number one. He's there in the beginning. He's always been there. Without him was nothing made. Everything was made for his exaltation so that he could have the preeminence among all things. He's been God. Has been, is, always will be. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the I am. Jehovah, the God that is, that lives. Okay, that's him. But he was appointed to be the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That was his. Nobody else could take it. But the time hadn't come for that to be fulfilled. Okay, then verse number 6 tells us, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because of what Jesus did, now we've received the adoption of sonship. But see, I didn't do it. Christ did it. If I didn't save myself, how could I cry unto God and say, Lord, I've made myself righteous, so now I have a claim to you. We had no claim to him. We couldn't do it. Which is why he sent the Spirit of his Son, the Holy Ghost, 
to live and indwell us, to seal us until the day of redemption so that our soul sins no more. And the Spirit cries, Abba, Father. Says, this is one of them that your son bought. Okay, he says, this one now is an heir just like your son. This one's in, and he got in through the blood. I can cry, Abba, Father, because the Spirit indwells me and cries, Abba, Father, also. Doesn't the book of Revelation say that in the judgment there will be those that say, didn't we preach, didn't we teach, didn't we prophesy, didn't we do these wonderful works in your name? They cry out to God and they name him as their father. But what does he say? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. There are some that try to call father on their own, but unless the Spirit's crying it, you're not there. Okay, now we went through all of that to get back to verse number one and verse number two. I'm now an heir. If you're saved, you're an heir. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Everything that Jesus owns, I own. But see, here's the thing. Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven for the last time. He said, all power has been given unto me. He had all power before. But now, all power, he was an heir to it. Now he has all power. God was in control of everything. But Jesus is saying... The Father has now given to me everything that the Father has. Now, that's one of the things we'd have to go very deep for very, very long. But Jesus is saying, I always was God. But just to remind you, I've still got all power. He's saying, there's nothing in heaven, there's nothing in earth. He that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Always has been, always will be. Don't believe me? Go read the book of Job. God's always been more powerful than the devil. The devil didn't have the keys to death and hell. It's just that God couldn't take up those keys before Jesus came because if he did, there would have been no hope for us. If God would have taken the keys to death and hell before Jesus came, then there would have been no way for us to get through the curses of sin to everlasting life. Jesus had to become the payment and redeem man so that he could take those keys. Because if God would have taken the keys of death and hell and said, I'm locking the door, right, these are mine, then there would have been no hope for us. It would have been God accepting that there was nothing that could be done for man. Okay, but he said no. The devil thought the keys were his, but he said, we'll leave those there. One day, those keys are going to be sitting out in the open because man chose to sin, and then one day my son will come. Okay. Then he'll take up those keys. All power will be given unto him. He'll have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Okay, Everything is his now. And because everything's his, then those heirs that come after him, everything will also be theirs because we're joint heirs with them. God looks at us. He sees Jesus. I've been robed in his righteousness. John said, I don't know what we're going to be like when we see him, but I know we'll be like him. Yeah, but until that day, that's our appointment. I don't know what we're going to be like, but one day, I'm going to be like him. I'm not right now. So in verse number two, when it says, but it is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, our appointed time is when one of these days, there's going to be a shout with the voice of an archangel. And then, if we're alive, we'll be called up second. But those which are in the grave, they're going to be called up first. They need some extra change in time. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, quickly changed, and so shall we ever be with Christ. Amen. Forevermore I'll be like him. But that's not now. I'm an heir, but the appointed time hasn't come yet. Even when we get to heaven, everything that God says, that this is your reward, this is what you've laid up for the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to say give it to him, because it's all because of him. I'm not going to claim anything that I may have the right to as an heir. I'm not going to want to sit on the throne of God because Christ deserves it. I didn't do it. He did. Everything that I did, the arm of flesh would have failed me, but Christ could have done because I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. He gave me the strength to do it. Even as an heir, when the appointed time comes, I'm just going to be happy to be there because I get to see him. 
but there are some that right now they think that they're the heir now they think that the appointed time has come in their life that God has given them the reins to their life if you think that's the case you don't believe the Bible but then I mean that's just the truth simplest way I can do it you don't believe me see me after church it'd take a whole lot longer than what we got left to prove to you that that was a true statement but verse number one now I say that an heir as long as he a child differeth nothing from a servant though he be lord of all there's going to be a day that I'll be like him forevermore I'll get that mansion that's in the father's house that has many rooms many mansions room for all of us there's a space for us at the father's table just like Mephibosheth made space for David or David made a space for Mephibosheth okay he said oh eat at my table with it's one of the king's sons when you got in God said pull up another chair that one's his he's an heir now okay what did David give to Mephibosheth everything that Saul his grandfather had owned all of Saul's servants everything that should have been is he got okay since I've been in all that I ever deserved was hell but he's given me the benefits that belong to Christ I get grace I get mercy I get love I get acceptance I'm a part of the beloved now okay I'm an heir but until the appointed time verse number one I'm still the servant one of these days I may be able to say that hey I own everything that Jesus owns that will be the case but right now I can't claim to own anything I'm still in the rudiments of this world in this flesh okay I'm still toiling and dealing with sin one day I'll be the heir I'll be a joint heir right now I've got the position there's a spot waiting on me but when a king has a child that child has to grow child has to learn has to mature has to continue to do things if the king were to say to the heir hey go fetch this for me he's no different than the servant he's got to go do it the heir cannot buck up and say no I don't want to do that to the king because he may have power one day he may have position one day he may sit on the throne one day because whether you realize it or not during the millennial reign we will rule and reign with Christ we all will be given a position will be given authority rewarded with a position there for how we treated him here in this life what we did in obedience to him through the spirit as a servant okay so what the Lord's up we're going to teach just for a little bit on heirs and lords heirs and lords if you're saved there's a bunch of heirs in here today there's only one Lord there's only one that has power now that one is three and those three are one so there's one one Lord many heirs and really all those other heirs aren't claiming that they're the heir because there's only one heir and he gave his only begotten son so that he could have more sons more children that he could redeem that which was lost in the garden over in Genesis chapter number 3 that what God created could once again be reunited with God and forever be with him throughout all eternity I'm an heir I don't even know what the name because he gave me a new name it's written down in the book of life I don't even know what my name is yet doesn't matter where I'm sitting because I'm at the king's table I'm one of his doesn't matter who my mansion's next to in God's house I'm in the house okay like I'm in I'm an heir that's great but I'm not the Lord I may be able to say that I belong to the king but the king's still the king just because I may have a name associated with the Lord does not mean that I get to make the decisions okay now first I want you to see that we don't get to make the decisions when it comes to 
our self-governance. Okay? Now it says that in verse number 2 that the heir is under tutors and governors. Okay, now first, to govern means to oversee, to instruct, what well, to direct, to instruct what they should do. I stopped talking before I got the rest of the sentence out. Not to teach, but to direct. Okay, a governor doesn't just oversee like a, a manager at a plant, like, hey, get back to work. They oversee many things. Not just one person, because then that's not a manager. That's just somebody following you around. Okay, a governor is in charge of much. Okay, now there may be those that are heirs that have been given positions to what the world may see like govern others. But if you were here on Wednesday night, God chose David to feed and lead Israel because David fed off of the Lord and followed the Lord. Of course you pick a shepherd to lead the people of God because the shepherd knows how to feed sheep. Well, what did David do while he was feeding sheep? He was walking and talking with God and writing God's songs. He followed after God even though he had a bunch of sheep following him. Okay, there are those that God has put into positions of authority. The Bible would call them bishops. We'd call them pastors. Okay, there are those that the pastor feels led of God to give a Sunday school class to or to give a children's ministry to or to give a vacation Bible school to or a jail ministry to. But those people don't have any real authority, even the pastor. The pastor is the under-shepherd that's supposed to follow the great shepherd. The pastor is the mouthpiece or the evangelist okay, to tell what he has heard from God. Okay, that's why back in chapter number 1 and chapter number 2, I believe chapter number 2, let me just double check real quick. No, it was chapter number 3. Chapter number 3 starts off with, O foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you. He's saying, you guys didn't know you weren't rooted in your heart what was the truth. And because you were foolish, you were bewitched by those that came in and preached something different. Twice in that chapter. Once right after the other, because he said, if I'm going to say it, it's worth saying twice. He says, doesn't matter if me, any other man, or an angel from heaven comes down and preaches to you a gospel different than what we've preached to you in the past, he said, let him be accursed. He said, who has bewitched you? Because they thought that they had governance over what they should believe. Now don't look down on these people. These are Gentiles. Their entire life, all they had known was paganism. All they had ever known was, well, we have multiple gods. Okay, that's a, a plural deistic religion, an omni-deist religion. Okay, look at the Greeks or look at the Romans, which stole what the Greeks had and just gave different names to it. If you went or look at Egypt in the Bible, why did God send all those plagues? To counteract all the gods that Egypt worshipped. To show that they did not have power. If they prayed to this god and it didn't work, they'd move to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Okay, I can't b believe how it happened, but you go over into India and you look at... Uh, Hinduism, they've got millions. That's six zeros with a one in front of it. And then there's actually more than that. Millions of different gods. How do you even have time to know what each of them do? Right? I've just got one, and he does it all. But see, back then, it was if I hit a hard spot, I'm going to hedge my bets. And I'm going to go to all of them. The Apostle Paul and see, people of the time knew that. So they would come in and they'd say, God's good, he's great, but let me tell you what else you can do. And in their minds, they're thinking, oh, we're just covering all the bases. The Apostle Paul writes to them, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you. They say, no, this is all you need, which is why he covered all that. Faith means law doesn't apply anymore. 
You don't have to worry about anything else. Faith is all you need. Then he says, but after faith you need fellowship because you're not the governor. He said, you're an heir. But right now you don't get to call the shots. A pastor truly is not a hireling who's given a position because he wants to be overall. He's not a uh, Diotrephes that loves the preeminence, as the Apostle Paul wrote about. Okay, Instead, a true pastor is just a follower of God. Someone that God has seen, has been faithful, knows and has proven to God that God can rely on them to follow better or they've learned more about following and they can lead others to places that they have not been before that's the job of a pastor to get others as close as he can his first job is himself to be as close to God as he can and then it's to watch for the souls of those that God's given him charge over and lead the flock as close as he can to where God wants them to be He's just a follower that's got other people following him. That brother Josh is in charge of the vacation Bible school. Got a burden for that. Went off well. Okay, it was a great time. Brother Josh was not the governor of the Bible school. He'll tell you that. For months ahead of time, he was looking through, trying to find the program or trying to find the material that God put his finger on. Why? Because he didn't want to do the vacation Bible school that Brother Josh wanted to do. He wanted to do the one that God wanted to do. He felt led of the Spirit which cries in him, Abba Father, that says, hey, this is an heir. This is one of yours. But he did his best to follow the Spirit so that he would do what God wanted him to do. Just follow him. I don't get up and preach what I want to preach. Because if I did... We'd go way too long and we'd talk about things that most of y'all don't care about. Kind of like my devotion from this week. I just, I felt led that that's what the Lord wanted me to do. That had a whole lot more history than a lot of you guys wanted in it. But we had to go through the history lesson to get to the point that God wanted to show. Okay, that's the way I, I like history. If I did it my way, I'd put visuals up here and show you stuff. Like Noah, back in the day, was still alive when his grandfather, which was one of the grandkids of Adam, was still alive. If you study out the timeline, Noah learned from his grandpa, which learned from his grandpa, which was Adam. Amen. Okay, We don't think of things like that because it's just this person begat this person and this person lived for so long and this person did that and this person did this at such and such a time. But if you plot it all out, there's some cool stuff in there. Right? We can take back and show you that you know this is what's happening. We can prove that this is what's happening in the world at the time. And while that was happening, you know, Nehemiah is over here, or Ezra's over here. Or in the time of Ruth, this is what was happening in the world to give more context. There's a lot that we can learn. But God don't want me to teach that. He wants me to teach out of Galatians chapter number four today. Okay, I have to follow. And in order to teach, I must learn, because I do not know. Because I am not all-knowing. I may know what the verse says, but I may not know what God wants you to get out of the verse before he shows me. In order to teach, one must learn. The hardest part about teaching study school is teaching yourself. Because if you don't know it, you can't teach it. So I have to follow. Master is the follower. That leads more followers. Okay, But even the pastor is not the governor over you. That's the Lord. The pastor will never preach anything contrary to what the Lord's will is for your life if he follows after the Lord, which thankfully ours has. Okay, but not only self-governance, self-direction. Okay, the governor may tell us, this is what you ought to do, this is how you're supposed to do it. God will instruct us, he will equip us, and then... As the governor, he may say, all right, you're fit for service. Okay, because back in the day, nobody was given power or authority or said, you know, hey, go do this for me, unless they bore the seal. Okay, we can also go where the Apostle Paul talks about that among stewards it's required that a man be found faithful. Okay, you don't get the seal that says, this person's on my business 
unless you've proven that you can be faithful. Okay, but the governor says, all right, you've got the seal. You're in charge of my business. This is what God wants you to do. You get the seal. You're a steward. Now, once you have the position, I'm free to do it however I want. But, as the Apostle Paul wrote, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. I can do it however I want, but I should desire to do it the way that God would have it to be done. I should do all things as unto Christ, as the Bible instructs us. I should do everything that I do, not just what God wants me to do, everything in my life. I should talk to the lady at the checkout counter as if I was talking to Christ. I should treat others with the respect that I would treat Christ with. Not for my sake, but because I bear the seal of the one that sent me. I can do it however I want. I can direct myself however I want to, but I should desire to be directed because I know I'm just an heir. And while I'm an heir, that one day I'll be a joint heir to everything that Christ owns. I've got that promise. It's forever settled in heaven. Half of it's already been told that we don't know yet. It's pinned in heaven waiting on us. Okay, there's a whole lot that we don't know, but I do know that right now, it may be encouraging to me, it may be edification to me to know that I'm one of his. It may, on a rough day, do me a whole lot of good to know that when he looks at me, he doesn't see Jordan, who's having a hard time, who's struggling through this right now. He looks down, he sees his son. But right now, I'm still just a servant. And if I know I'm a servant, I don't want to do things the way that I do it. When I do it, I mess it up. Even if I do it right, I'm not doing it the way that God would have done it because God does all things well. Every now and then, you know, I may ricochet one on a putt-putt course off of a wall that bounces around a few times and it goes in. I didn't know it was going to do that, didn't even think it was going to do that. Right, but it just, it happened. All things are love, not all things are expedient. Not all things are prudent, are the best way to do them. Not all things, the way that I can do it, fully rely upon the Lord. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Sometimes I put confidence in what I can do. I can only do it because God's equipped me to do it and empowered me to do it. So if I try to do it on my own, He may remove His hand, and like Samson, I may not perceive that the strength that the Lord has given me has departed. He went out to face the Philistines like he had so many times before, but he got whipped that time. And he didn't even perceive while he was going out that he didn't have what he used to have. Because if I try to make the directions, if I try and do what it is that God wants me to do, I'll make a mess of it. If I don't know, there's no shame in a steward coming back and saying, Master, I know that this is what you want me to do. And I'm fairly certain of how you would want me to do it, but I just want to check beforehand to make sure that this is how you would want me to do it. It's better to clarify than later to apologize. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. It's better to do what God would have us to do than later to get it reconciled for doing the wrong thing. Saul never would have had to apologize for the way that he treated the, or treated the instructions that God gave him with the Amalekites if he would have stayed little in his own eyes. God made him a king, but he wasn't the king. God was the king. Israel desired one that would lead them in how God would have the nation to be led. One person for God to say, this is how it should be. Okay, well, that should have been the prophet. Should have been the man of God. But Israel said, give us a person. Saul, when he was little in his own eyes, was used greatly of God to lead the people of God. But Saul started self-directing. Saul started thinking that God had given him the authority. No, he was just the one that was supposed to follow. And when 
a situation arose. He was the one that had been given, not a position, but the responsibility to say, Lord, how would you have your people respond? How would you have me instruct your people because you've given me the ability to tell your people what to do? Instead, he thought, I'll do what I want to do because God may be king. But the reason God made him king is because God has all authority. He has all power. He rises those up and he also tears them back down. God just gives some of his authority to other people and says, for a time, you are the one that I choose to be in this position. Well, after Saul got big in his eyes, after he made that grave error in judgment, that's when God sent the prophet over and said, hey, go over to Jesse's house, son of Obed, who, by the way, was the one that was born of Boaz and Ruth. Okay, we're the one that's been grafted in. Okay, but get, anyway, go study that out on Ruth. Good story. Don't have time for it. I'm already almost over time. But the point is, David was the one that said, Lord, I'll lead them how you want me to lead them. He was already a man after God's own heart, or else God wouldn't have picked him. Because David knew, I may be a son of Jesse. I may be anointed by the prophet to be the next king over Israel. I may have all these, but I'm still just a servant. Even as king, he said, Go read the Psalms. And all the times, never does he call the Lord anything else but Lord, meaning master, meaning the one that has authority over me. He's saying whatever you want whenever he says the word Lord. He's saying you're in charge. Whatever it is that you want. Why do you think that he called upon the Lord? Because he knew that the Lord was stronger than he was. He knew that the Lord could handle things that he could not. We don't get all those benefits if we try to be the Lord instead of being an heir. One day we'll be just like him. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Sure. But right now, I should be more focused about being what he wants me to be Amen. than thinking that I am already what one day I will become. Time has not come that's been appointed for us to be lords. But I have been made a king over this body to rule and reign and compel it to do the will of the Father. Because I'm supposed to be a servant. Yeah, I'm an heir. But only because of Jesus. Amen. And because I love Him, I want to be as good of a servant as I can be. So that when the appointed time comes, I can say, Lord, I loved you so much that I did all this. Which is why I'm going to give these rewards back to you. Amen. He may give me a position in the millennial reign. But the entire time, whatever it is that I get to do for him, he's still the one that's sitting on the throne to David. I may be given a position, but he's still the heir. He's still the one that I'm going to give all the credit to, who I'm going to obey because I love him. Got to be a servant because it's not the appointed time. You know what happens to kids that even though they may be princes, that don't obey their lords, the kings, their fathers most of the time they don't live long enough to get to the point where they will be the heir look at Absalom look at those that tried to rise up against God, what happens to them he will remove, them. he will turn them over to the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved Amen. it's just better to be a servant and not hunger for being a lord and to follow him, because otherwise we'll make a mess of it. Arm of flesh will fail you. The heart is exceedingly wicked. No man can know the desires of his own heart. Even the tongue, such a small member, can cause such destruction or division, as James wrote, just like a rudder on the back of a ship controls the vessel. If my desires work their way up through my mouth, that's what I'm going to do. The tongue the way that I talk, the way that I desire in my heart, I can steer me. And if what's down here is replaced from being a desire, a desire to be a servant, is replaced with a desire to be in control, I'm going to make a mess of everything. But I may be an heir. But right now, I just want to be a servant. I want to be a steward. I want to do what he wants me to do, 
because I know that he's got a purpose for it. I know that he does all things well, and I know that I'm just a piece in the larger picture that if I do my part, I have faith that he's going to get the rest of it completed and God's will will be done.